Able Then On Air is sponsored by Green Mountain Support Services, empowering people with disabilities to be home in the community. Washington County Mental Health, where hope and support comes together. Media sponsors for Able Then On Air include Parkchester Times, Muslim Community Report, www.thisisthebronx.info, Associated Press Media Editors, New York Parrot Online Newspaper, U.S. Press Corps, Domestic and International, Anchor FM, and Spotify. Partners for Ableton On Air include Yihad New York and New England, where everyone belongs, the Orthodox Union, the Vermont Division for the Blind and Visually Impaired, the Vermont Association for the Blind and Visually Impaired, the Montpelier Sustainable Coalition, Central Vermont Habitat for Humanity. Able Den on Air has been seen in the following publications. Parkchester Times, New York Parrot Online Newspaper, Muslim Community Report, www.thisisthebronx.info, and www.h.com. Able Den on Air is a member of the National Academy for Television Arts and Sciences Boston, New England chapter. Welcome to this edition of Ableton On Air, the one and only program that focuses on the needs, concerns, and achievements of the disability able. I've been your host, Lauren Seiler. And on this program, we're going to talk to Morgan Brown, Montpelier resident, former uh, homeless task force uh, member of the city council uh, about his advocacy and about mental health and homelessness. Um, but before that, we would like to say um, special thanks to our sponsors, um, Washington County Mental Health, Green Mountain Support Services, and many others, including the support from um, the, uh, the Division for the Blind and Visually Impaired of Vermont, and the Vermont Association for the Blind and Visually Impaired, and the Montpelier Sustainable Coalition. And the, the Sustainable Montpelier Coalition. Um, welcome, Morgan Brown, to Able Den on Air. Thank you. Uh, so, um, tell me, uh, tell us a little bit about um, your advocacy and your activism with uh, mental health and homelessness, and why is it important to do that kind of work? Um, it would help. If, if I had a frame of reference about where to start. <laughs> okay. Well, I'll tell you what. Why don't you start by by saying, you know, uh, you know the kind of work you do. You know, obviously, advocacy is a thankless job. So why? Well, first off, it's not a job for me. It's always been a labor of love, and mm -hmm. um, I've always done it on a volunteer basis. Mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, I never have been tied with other organizations, but yeah, I network a lot, you know, share information, things, and mm -hmm. um, and but I've always been an ind independent operator, and mm -hmm. um, you know, basically when I got started, mostly I, I just observed and you know, listened and, and uh, watched what, what's going on and obtain information, and especially when uh started going up to State House in 1991 after mm -hmm. I moved to Montpelier. Um, one thing I, I knew to do instinctively is just go sit in on uh, various committees that I knew that certain legislation would come up before those committees, you know, down the road. Mm. So I'd go sit on those committees when they're taking up certain bills and stuff that have nothing to do with the things I'm interested in necessarily. And what that helped do was I was able to um, 
learn what was important to certain legislators. What kind of questions do they ask? Mm -hmm. And that, that helped with um, a number of things, including, you know, some people, when they go to the legislature, they go like a bull in a china shop. And they're saying, we want this and we want that. And the legislators go, yeah, uh-huh, and okay. And they don't necessarily listen to them and stuff. If you go in uh, prepared and you've, you've done your you know, prep work, you're not going to get all excited necessarily. Mm -hmm. And you go in, you go in calm, and, and you just let, you know, develop relationships and stuff. And the other thing that helps is they get to see you. They don't know necessarily who you are or what you want, but they've seen you. And that helps. And the other thing, a uh, real important thing, is you go to the cafeteria and go have lunch. It, it, and, it's open to the public, correct? Yes. Well, this is before COVID, but yes, before the pandemic. And so you go in there and you have lunch and, and you meet people, including legislators. And you don't talk shop. You know, you just you develop relationships slowly and you have conversation. And, you know, they're human beings, you know. And so that kind of thing helps, you know. And, and that, that's what I brought to what I did. And then when I'm ready to kick into advocacy gear, you know, um, I'm not going in like some people, you know, where they're getting, you know, very demanding and all excited and stuff. And they're total strangers. They, they haven't done any prep work necessarily, you know. They haven't necessarily, you know, met with their legislators or, or other legislators beforehand and had conversations with them. And, and it doesn't have to be about... Uh, what you might be asking them for down the road, you know, and mm. those kind of things are important. And right off the bat, I want to mention that I've always been concerned about many different matters, what other people call issues. And I did that purposefully uh, because, for one, I'm very concerned about a lot of different matters. But, you know, People oftentimes, the way I approach when I do focus in on homelessness or affordable housing or mental health or disabilities, it can seem like, you know, that's the only thing that I'm uh, um, interested in because, you know, I, I, I uh, focus very hard on that. And, but it's not the only thing I'm concerned about. But when I am focused on it, Yes, I am, you know, I can be intense. Um, one, since we mentioned homelessness, I wanted to, you know, there's a big thing on the table, well, I say on the table. Um, you know, you were former homelessness, you know, you were formerly homeless. And, Unhoused. And, and now you're housed. Yep. Okay. Um, there's a big situation with motel vouchers, and that motel that or hotel that was recently bought or purchased by Good Samaritan Haven. Right. And I'm I'm noticing here your um um my computer here, uh uh your op ed or or commentary commentary about homelessness. Uh can you explain the the problems with, or uh, we don't want to call them problems, the the situation with that hotel, the homelessness situation, and you know why in your Vermont, because obviously in other states there's a bigger homelessness problem, or globally there's a homelessness problem. Explain your take on the situation. Um, it's all yours. Go ahead. Okay. So, 
Well, you're asking a lot there. <laughs> but go, that's fine. Go ahead. So I'm going to hone in on, on what's going on, say, in our region. Okay. In our region. Right. So there's, as I understand it, about 300 or so people that um, have been unhoused, and there's a, some of them that are still in the motels. However, as I understand it, uh, they might not necessarily have access to the motels or hotels, you know, come the, uh, towards the end of this month. Uh, I don't know how many might be able to be maintained in motels, if any. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, right now I'm in Montpelier, if I understand it, I think it's Montpelier, there's about uh, 40 people who are unhoused and living outdoors, mm -hmm. as I understand. And and then there's going to be more, you know, they'll be leaving the motels, hotels, and then... Is it more problematic in the winter? Go ahead. If I may answer the first question. Yes, sir. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then you also have evictions now coming down the pike in addition to that, okay? Uh, so... You know, being unhoused is problematic any time. It's even more problematic uh, during the winter. Um, but for me, when I was living unhoused, uh, you know, I really had I had a hard time during the summer because I don't do good in the heat and the humidity. And then some summers are kind of wet and maybe even cool at night. And and you know, uh, that can be tough. But, you know, uh, having to live outdoors, uh, you know, when you don't have any other option or choice uh, is very difficult. And then on top of that, if a per uh, person has health conditions or disabilities and the like, uh, it's even tougher. And even if you didn't have health problems or disabilities or or other struggles uh, you, you can end up with them and and you know uh, take your time housing uh, is essential you know and a lot of people take housing for granted until you don't have it and um, I like the housing first model. Uh, Pathways Vermont is an example of that. And they do real good because, except if people come through the prison system, the correction system, um, the strings you said attached. Correct, you said corrections? Corrections, prisons. Uh, there are strings attached, but if, if people aren't going from uh, that system, there's no strings attached. And people are offered services on a voluntary basis, but there's no strings attached for people who are, you know, are coming through the correction system. Uh, and I'm gonna ask you, what do you mean by string? I'm, I'm sorry. Strings. Strings. You know, conditions. 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 Okay. And so the people that don't have conditions, they can accept voluntary services or not. But they still get the housing even if they, uh, you know, don't want the services, and that's a, that's important. And even if they don't accept services, to you know, and they but they accept the housing, there's one essential ingredient that they still get. So the question is, what is it? You know, besides you know, the money that it takes and the housing and other things to support all that, there's one essential ingredient that helps people get housed and maintain housing. Which and is? that's relationships. And that's one of the things that uh, Housing First model provides because a relationship is created 
you know, between somebody who's working with with them on their on the person's own terms within reason, and you know, that's important. That relationship is essential, and mm -hmm. that's what helps. Now, I didn't go through a Housing First model program, but it might as well have been because. I had people working with me, including family members and others, and they helped me get housed. It wasn't housing first, but in essence, it, it sort of was, you know, and it made the difference. Mm -hmm. It's people working with somebody who's in need, but as an equal, as a partner, not as trying to fix me or, you know, trying to, uh, you know, make me jump through hoops or do this. If that was the case, if there were strings attached and conditions, I'd still be out there or dead, you know, and... No, you don't want that second option. No, but, you know, I would have been, I could have got locked up in the state hospital, you know, I could have been, end up in way worse condition than I even was, and I had been real bad condition at times, mm -hmm. or, or dead, and that, that happens, you know, it happens to people. And, but people interceded and, and worked with me, okay? Not, not trying to so it's do it for me, but they worked with me. And it made all the difference. It's important to have a support system. Yeah, it is. That's the point of the, this. Well, yes, but... And when I say relationships, other people are uncomfortable with that term and they want to say connections, but it's relationships. It's meaningful, healthy relationships, you know, and, and those, that key ingredient that makes a difference. That's what helps people get housed. Uh, I've read up about this a lot over the years. Go ahead. Yeah. And it's so important. And, and the other thing is Pathways Vermont, for example, one of the Housing First models, you know, they work with people who everybody has given up on, mm. including the person themselves oftentimes. Yeah. So what do you do? And the relationships help because it builds trust. And if a person's lost hope, maybe they can borrow some. Mm from the other people, if they're comfortable doing that. And if the other people are comfortable. One thing I, I always say is don't promise anything though. You know, the people working with somebody, don't promise anything because people have been burned. They've been promised stuff and then it doesn't work out and then they, the person ends up feeling even worse and usually about themselves. Mm. You know, people don't understand what people have gone through and why, you know, why people oftentimes end up the way they do. And, you know, think about if it, people need to think about what if it was you, you know, or if somebody you cared for, a family member or, or dear friend, you know, what would you want for yourself or for them, you know? And... Hmm. I see your point, yeah. And any question did you want to ask? Go ahead. You're, that you're, all depends on, you know, what it comes down to isn't necessarily about funding, as people often say, oh, we don't have funding, blah, blah, blah. It's about political will, exercising political will, and making things a high priority. You know, anytime it's funny. They often say they don't have money for this and that, but when they have some pet project, something that, they, you know, is important for them, you know, like the Montpelier pool, for example. Yeah. Or that's not really that. I mean, is that really for that some important? people? Huh? For is some it people, really it that? was. Yeah. And so, guess what? The city council got that thing open. You know, and and then you know, when it came to the Girton Park structure that s some members of the community and city council was concerned about, you know, they focus a lot of energy and time and political will on the moving that Girton Park structure because uh, 
there was a certain population using it that made people uncomfortable. Well, why don't they take that energy and address what the root problem is? And take money, and take the money, take money from the pot and use it well, no, for more. There wasn't money in the park, okay? No There's, money in the pot. Oh, pot. pot. Okay, yeah. So the the thing is, if they wanted to, they could find the resources and the funding, but it it's all about political will and exercising that. That's what it's about and making things a high priority. And Do you, but they yeah. don't even bother because they've already decided that it's not doable. So do you think that... So if it was mm -hmm. made a high priority and they exercise the political will, yes, they could end homelessness. Period. Done. Well, do you think... Do you it's think, since it's you being said done that, elsewhere. Since you said that, since you said that, I'm going to ask you a question. Do you think that... You can answer this however you want. Do you think... Because globally, there is a homeless problem. It's not just local, it's global, it's everywhere. Do you think politicians should really concentrate on getting their priorities straight, if you get my point, and, and concentrate on the matters at hand instead of going everywhere else? Yeah. In your opinion. This is freedom of speech. Go ahead. I think... I've sort of already answered the question. Yeah. Okay. Kind and of piggyback off it. I'm sorry. So I think what they need to do is to make these, make affordable housing and homelessness a higher priority than they have mm -hmm. and exercise the political will. And then the other, one of the problems with homelessness, just like with mental health, yeah. is the populations are treated as if they are the problem. Or third class citizens. Or well, people. not even that, okay? And what they need to do is realize that people who are unhoused are part of the solution. And we need to treat them as partners, you know? And not as a problem, not as something to be done with or kicked aside or, or kicked down the road and, or, or do this to, do that to, but, you know, create a system that treats them as the human beings they are and, and you know, uh, because a lot of times the systems at play, whether it's homelessness or mental health, it can be very dehumanizing. And, Understood. Yeah. And yep. it, it also institutional, institutionalizes people, even if you, it, it might not be brick and mortar, but it's still institutionalized. And we, we need to, you know, uh, we need to work with people to support them to be able to live as independently as they might be able to at any given time. And not put in place things that deprive them of their ability to live independently. You mean you know, stumbling blocks? All kinds of stumbling blocks, all kinds of conditions and all kinds of requirements that you got to do this and do that. that you know, the average person who's living in a certain kind of housing rental or whatever doesn't have to do. And, and you know, those kind of things add up, you know. And, and Can you explain some of the stumbling blocks? I mean, of course we're going to go over it. It's fine. Can you explain some of the stumbling blocks that might be in somebody's way? Mm -hmm. Well, for one thing, like I already said, if, if there have been conditions placed on me, I wouldn't have got housed. Mm -hmm. uh, when, when the funding was, when the housing was made available and the funding was made available in the warranty conditions, that was agreeable to me and, and, and I got housed. And, uh, and then, you know, th there's all kinds of conditions and things that 
I wish I could give them examples, but there, right. there are all kinds of conditions and stuff that often get in uh, um, somebody's way. Somebody's way. I mean, you know, and people have had <laughs> enough stuff. We should make it more difficult. And, um, you know, it's like we're punishing people, you know, because they've had hardships. And, and we're blaming people, you know, like finding fault. Well, what did you, oftentimes I've been asked, oh, Morgan, how did you end up homeless? And my answer, oh, what, you mean the first time when I was 17 years old and fleeing severe abuse, you know? physical, emotional, and so on. Mm -hmm. I didn't feel I'd get beat again. That shut that person up, you know? And the thing is, it, it shouldn't matter how or why, mm -hmm. you know? The point is you got through it. Well, no, the point is, Larry, mm -hmm. that it shouldn't matter how or or why a person ended up there, and that, you know, trying to find fault with the person, you know, because we think that's the root cause. You know what the root cause of homelessness is? Poverty. Mm -hmm. That's the root cause. Poverty. That's the truth. Yeah. That's the truth. Go and ahead. high rents. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, you know, low wages, high rents, you know. Yeah. Mm. But <laughs> and 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 here's here's the commentary and, and the thing. If America is so rich, and we're a rich country, right? Why is it that we have homelessness? Why is it that we have people on Medicaid, people on food stamps? We shouldn't have that. If other countries are dealing with giving people free health care and treating people better. And meanwhile, you got mil billionaires, millionaires, corporations, and businesses that aren't paying anything in taxes. Yeah. Amen, brother. <laughs> and and then, you know. Yeah, that's your don't point. Don't get me going on that. <laughs> no, no, go ahead, go ahead. You're, it's it's the floor. It's you have the floor. Mm. Go ahead, continue. The if. If those who have more than their uh, share of wealth contributed to the tax base, we wouldn't have these problems. That's true. Okay. And with that said, uh, anything else you would like to add? Um, now, we're going to briefly talk about your mental health advocacy. No. Um, how do you help in with that? Um, and why is it important for that piece? Well, um, so uh, my mother ended up in the mental health system, and and uh, I was separated from her uh, oh, within my first year or, or thereabouts. Mm -hmm. and I I hadn't hadn't seen her till till I was 17 years old and I caught up with her. And, uh, but she had ended up in the mental health system. So I was, I've, I've been a family member, uh, that was my initiation. Uh, my father ended up in the mental health system as well uh, when I was a teenager. Uh, so uh, it was double that. And then, you know, I, I've lived with, uh, what gets termed as severe depression and panic attacks and, and anxiety, uh, severe anxiety, uh, post-traumatic stress disorder, basically, um, for for much of my life. Uh, um, I had major sleeping disorders since I've been a teenager, um, and the like, and. It, it eventually caught up with me uh, uh, during my marriage, mm -hmm. and uh, my marriage broke up, and it hit, hit me 
real hard, and so everything caught up with me, and I ended up in the mental health system. Oh, yeah. And, uh, you know, so there I am, separated, and, and um, you know, it wasn't just me anymore, so I had to do something different, and I went to the so, uh, social welfare office where I was living at the time, elsewhere, southern New England, and um, I'm trying to apply for, you know, uh, benefits, and I see a sign on the wall, and it said, if you believe you have an emotional disability, you might qualify for uh, Social Security disability. And I'm like, well, yeah, uh, I, I definitely, that's no stretch. I definitely, you know, <laughs> big time. Right. And I didn't sign up for the mental health stuff, the psychiatric stuff, uh, although I did get a lot of the, some, some labels there, you know, some uh, diagnoses. Um, but, you know, that's what I signed up with Social Security for, is that. And, and, because, uh, you know, I've, I've had major emotional and also learn. I had learning disabilities, but I was never diagnosed. But mm -hmm. I could have been if back then they they tended to focus on that. But I was probably on the high spectrum order. You know, of, I could I could have been uh, diagnosed with. Um, Well, nowadays it's like tension deficit disorder, but I, I actually when I was real young, I could have been diagnosed with uh, autism. You know, um, uh, but anyway, mm -hmm. uh, I, in uh, elementary school, well, what was it? I don't know, third third grade maybe, fourth grade. I was put in a special class for students who were slow. Mm -hmm. You know, and the thing is, none of us were slow. We just... You had labeled it that way. We were labeled that way, but, you know, it's funny. They expect everybody to think and process and memorize the same. And not everybody does. And it doesn't mean that you're necessarily slower. Uh, you know, maybe there's something with, wrong with the educational system. And and anyway, that's as as far as it went. But still, mm -hmm. you know, that's an example. And you know, I did have trouble. I I did have some so-called learning disabilities and stuff. But anyway, there were different things. And and so anyway, it all kind of caught up with me. And and uh, so I ended up. Uh, even as a teenager, I, I oftentimes had major suicidal ideation. Mm -hmm. uh, what is that? Well, I felt like killing myself, you know. Mm -hmm. I, I didn't want to die, but I didn't like living under certain conditions, you know. And so when the marriage went down the tubes, you know, uh, you know, uh, I could foresee what my life was going to become, and I wasn't feeling like participating in that. <laughs> you know, so I tried to. I came. Um, I came real close to killing myself, and uh, they barely could resuscitate me at one point. And oh, uh, really? Wow. Yep. Yeah, and but then. When I came to, you know, I figured, okay. So it was a suicide attempt. Is that what uh, you well, I, like I said, they barely were able to resuscitate me. Yeah. The only reason why I called, you know, the Good Samaritan hotline was I wanted them to call the coroner because I didn't want my the buddy I was staying with, couch surfing with, uh, to find me. So I wanted them to come cut me off. I was I didn't tell them to call the ambulance. I said call the coroner, and because um, I was serious about it, you know. Uh, um, 
And then you, you... But then I came to and, um, uh, you know, uh, one, um, I was able to get out, but then later when I was having trouble, I go up to the emergency room and they said I cut me off to the state hospital. They should have had a shuttle bus there, Larry, you know, because uh, the, the local hospital didn't want to deal with me anymore. So they just found an excuse and shipped me off. And the state hospital said, what are you doing here? <laughs> said, the I have no choice. They sent me here. And, and uh, it was, Larry, it was funny. <laughs> Mm. <laughs> he always like he should have had a shuttle bus, and and seriously. Um, so when I finally got disability after two year struggle, you know, uh, legal aid helped me uh, down there. Um, I was on the first bus of a month <laughs> after I got my check. So where you were living My somewhere else. I was living in southern New England, yeah, Massachusetts, the okay. eastern portion of Massachusetts. And uh, so I took the next bus up, to, lived in Rutland for three years, and then 91, I moved up to Montpelier. Okay. And I started, I was doing some advocacy down in Massachusetts a little bit for people, um, but... It really kicked into high, higher gear once I moved to Vermont. Okay. Well, with that said, we would like to thank you so much for joining us on this edition of Able to On Air. And please come back uh, for more information on um, for more information on Able to On Air. You can go to www.orcamedia.net. And um, we would like to thank Morgan uh, Brown, uh, uh, former uh, former member of the homelessness for the homeless task force uh, for the city council of Montpelier and Montpelier resident. Um, I'm Lauren Seiler. I'm Arlene Seiler. See you next time on Able Then On Air. Ableton On Air is sponsored by Green Mountain Support Services, empowering people with disabilities to be home in the community. Washington County Mental Health, where hope and support comes together. Media sponsors for Ableton On Air include Parkchester Times, Muslim Community Report, www.thisisthebronx.info, Associated Press Media Editors, New York Parrot Online Newspaper, U.S. Press Corps, Domestic and International, Anchor FM, and Spotify. Partners for Ableton On Air include Yachad, New York and New England, where everyone belongs, the Orthodox Union, the Vermont Division for the Blind and Visually Impaired, the Vermont Association for the Blind and Visually Impaired, the Montpelier Sustainable Coalition, Central Vermont Habitat for Humanity. Able Dinner on Air has been seen in the following publications, Parkchester Times, New York Parrot Online Newspaper, Muslim Community Report, www.thisisthebronx.info, and www .h. Ableton On Air is a member of the National Academy for Television Arts and Sciences, Boston, New England chapter.